Thank you, Janet and Steve. I appreciate you singing, ministering to us in song. Well, this month, the theme is abandon, which means just give it up. Doing and serving with all of your life, with all of your purpose. When I was um, an administrative pastor in Springfield, Missouri, one of the things I got to do is I got to meet a lot of young pastors and a lot of young missionaries that were preparing for their life call. One of those missionary families that I had the privilege of meeting was Keith and Lisa Sampson. And when I met them, they were preparing their life in Bible college to give their calling to go to Russia to serve in the Russian community. So Keith and, Lamps, Keith and Lisa, they, they prepared their life and they, they uh, served on their staff, on, on church staffing, and then they decided they were going to go to Russia. And they had the privilege of coming here many years ago, 10, 12 years ago, when we were brand new as a ministers here. And uh, we took them on for support right before they went to Russia. And they haven't been back in over 8 to 10 years. So we had them come back today. They have served Russia with abandonment. They went in and they decided that was what God has called them to do. It's exciting to see what God has done and what God is going to do with a servant with the spirit of saying, I know what my calling is, I know what my purpose is, and I'm going to do what God has called me to do. Over the next three weeks, we're going to meet three different couples, and they all have served God with abandonment. They are serving, going, giving their life to do what God has called them to do. I've asked Keith, if he would, in this section, to come and talk to us about his ministry, what he has done, and what he is planning to do in the future. So Keith is going to show us some slides, and he's going to tell us what he has done in Russia over the last few years. God bless you. Let's make him welcome. Did you almost call me Keith Lampson? No. Uh, I thought I almost heard a slip out of there. It's, it's fun being here. I wish I could be around uh, Bruce and Leslie Moore. We had uh, some good years together. Reminisced about some of that last night. Um, good to be at the church here. Great to see the new auditorium. I'm used to the, uh, when I was here, you were, you were in the other one. Uh, I really like the feel of the people here. I really like uh, the energy I have here. And, and I trust that there are people here that love Jesus and want to serve him. Uh, sometimes people build missionaries higher than they need to be built. Okay, we're just like you. Uh, we sin. We strive to serve God. We try to do what we need to do. We try to uh, abandon all on a daily basis. Paul said, I die daily. It's not a one-time thing. And so uh, anyway, my, uh, I want to go ahead and show you some uh, pictures of our ministry. Um, and then we'll go through those uh, up here. I say uh, to the Gulf of Finland region, because very, very few people know where Estonia is. We served in Russia and Estonia. My oldest daughter, Candice, she's 17. Chris is 15. My boy, Philip, he is 11 now. And my wife, Lisa. Uh, Russia is the largest country in the world. It has 11 time zones just within the continental part of the country. Um, we uh, work around the Gulf of Finland, cities that are around the Gulf of Finland, like Helsinki, St. Petersburg, Russia, and uh, uh, Narva, Estonia. We started out in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, it's a city of uh, six to eight million people. We worked there for three years. Uh, and then uh, after we had some visa issues, we moved over to Narva, Estonia, right across the border. Uh, and the winters are long, cold, and dark. Uh, winter from uh, November, December to April, May. Hardly any sun during the winter at all. Summer's just the opposite. Sun all the time. You can see sun up until uh, midnight uh, there. Um, and when we, uh, a lot of people, when they think of Russia, they think of communism. But communism was only in Russia for about 70 years, not very long. Russian Orthodox was, was part of Russian's core, their root, for a thousand years before communism ever came in. That's really what the root of the people are. It's similar to Catholicism, split from Catholicism about a thousand years ago. Uh, here's a church that I served in, the missionary, uh, after we learned the Russian language, the missionary said, hey, can you uh, take our church, because I'm leaving, and if you don't, we'll probably just let the church uh, die out, close the doors. So we took it, uh, the church got strengthened, and while we were there, they voted on their very first Russian pastor. That was exciting to us. They always had an American missionary as their pastor. So when he did that, we kind of uh, stepped aside and, and, and focused on evangelism. All that happened in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, after we came back and visited some churches, 
uh, a few years back, then we moved to Narva, Estonia. It's only 100 miles away from St. Pete. Narva, Estonia is on one side of the river, and Russia is on the other side. That's how close we are. We share a common border. The only way to put one foot in Russia and one foot in uh, Estonia is to get on a boat there in the middle of the river or get on a bridge here like you see my, two of my kids doing on one of our trips into Russia. Uh, we live, our apartment's on, only just a few minutes walk away from the border. Another thing that we do there, uh, this is in St. Petersburg, is evangelism. We go around, we share the gospel with people in the Russian language, uh, talk to them about sin, the consequences of sin, eternal judgment and how to get forgiveness through Christ alone. We hand out Bibles, we hand out tracts. Uh, this is my soul winning partner that I went out with the most in St. Petersburg, Russia. Alex Andreev, one of my best friends. Um, he's currently living in Russia. This is one guy that went out with me the most in Narva, Estonia. His name is uh, Valeri. Uh, that's his wife, he got married a couple years ago. Another way that we get out the gospel besides just street evangelism, passing out tracts, is a soccer ministry. It started out with younger kids, uh, we would have Bible lessons with them. And then uh, we started getting into an older kids' ministry. Uh, now we work with kids between 16, uh, 22 years old. Uh, we have 10 different teams, three different cities around the country. It's growing really fast. Those two kneeling down there are two of the ones that got saved from that ministry. Uh, this here is our most fruitful ministry that we're able to uh, meet with people and, and to see them get saved. Here's a Bible study that we had. Uh, I, we get to meet with these guys week after week, month after month, and build a relationship with them and keep sharing Christ with them. Uh, this next guy right here, he died about two and a half years ago. Don't know why. He was walking around Narva. He died. I went to his funeral. You know, you, you never know when you're going to die. It could be young. It could be old. It could be now. It could be many years in the future. And so uh, these things about eternity is very important. And that's why one of the major reasons why we're there is uh, so people can be prepared for eternity. This building here is where we hold our church services. We rent a room here. We remodeled it. In addition, in addition to church services, we have English lessons there. I have a lady that comes in and teaches that as an outreach. Um, we have family game night. This is really cool. Uh, we invite people from the English uh, lessons, from the church, from everywhere we can. They come over. We have food. We have fun. We have games. And we present the gospel, especially around Christmas or Easter and things like that. I'm standing next to probably the largest ping pong paddle you've ever seen. There was a company that asked this lady to t help them with their English because they sell professional ping pong products around the world, Europe, Africa, China. And uh, here they are, and they s she was leaving. This lady that was teaching was leaving for good, uh, our city. And they said, can you continue with us? I said, only if I can go through this gospel brochure with you. So for a month, two, twice a week, we were, went through that in English and shared the gospel with them, which is a lot of fun. A lot of drinking there, uh, but when I look at Russia, a lot of people think of communism, they think of uh, some of the political problems between America, I think of some of my best friends there. I think of people that still need to be saved there. I think of people that's been saved and they still need to be discipled there. And uh, that's where our heart is, is Estonia and right across the, uh, Russia, right across the river in Estonia to share the gospel. We want to thank the church here for partnering with us. Without churches like you, we wouldn't be able to buy the tickets to go over there. We wouldn't be able to eat while we're over, over there. It's expensive to do ministry over there. This church partners with us, with us on a monthly basis. And we consider that partnership a great privilege of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. We also want to thank you for praying for our family. And if you've read any of our missionary letters, we've had some medical issues with our family. Here's a big old swing about an hour from my house when we drive to the capital city. Uh, that we like to go and have fun on. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for praying for our ministry and for our family. And it is a thrill to be with you guys here today. He's going to be sharing a message in a couple minutes. But the idea that we have for our mission celebration is this. It is not just a group of missionaries coming in and sharing a good message. The idea of a mission celebration or a missions conference, or a missions focus, is to take the heart of our missionaries and to grab a hold of our thought process, to give to us a worldview of Christ. What does it look like to be in a third world country, to be overseas in Russia, to be in Morocco, or to even be in Wales? What does it look like to be a pastor or a church member? What does it look like to have Christ in the center of their life? And it was obvious 
what it looks like. It looks like us in a soccer field or a basketball court. People that need Christ. Our goal is to take missionaries from Wichita, from the United States, and plant them into a culture that needs Christ. How do we do that? Because Glenville has to fall in love with the message that we have in order for us to give that message to another culture. If we don't fall in love with the message, transfer that love from the message to the messenger, we will never sacrifice for the worldview of Christ. That is what missions is all about. The Bible tells us that our job is to go into all the world to preach the gospel. You and I are not going to go into all the world. But what we are going to do is we are going to find people that God has called to go into separate parts of the world, get behind them, not only financially, but also in our prayer, in our encouragement, in our email. There's no need now that... Keith and Lisa would have to go to Russia without being communicated to on a weekly basis by people that love them, that pray for them. How do we do that? Is you get to know him. You hear him. You understand his heart. You understand the other missionaries and say, you know what, I can get behind that. I can support that. I can get a world view, not of Wichita, Kansas, but in different countries around the world. That's what missions is all about. It's not about the flags. It's about the people. How do you get to know people is to get to know the missionary that loves the people that's coming to talk to you about their calling. What they have abandoned their life for is to do what God has called them to do. If you would, let's open your Bibles to Judges chapter 17. Judges chapter 17. This is where our launch pad is going to be from in our message. And if you would, let's listen to the words and watch the words on Judges chapter 17. Chapter 17. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his brother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son, to make a graven image and a molten image. Now therefore I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took two hundred shekels of silver, and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had an house of gods, and made an ephod and a teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. It sounds like a very strange verse, part of scripture to start off with. But um, I titled this sermon, uh, I Know That God Will Bless Me. What? Does that sound catchy at all? That was my wife's idea. I had a different one, but uh, I usually go with her ideas. She liked that one. Judges chapter 17. Um, this is a confusing part of Scripture for me. I started reading through the Bible when I was a teenager. And um, I come across Scriptures that are occasionally a little confusing. And when I came across this, this scripture is about uh, a, a son. He stole money from his mother, 1,100 shekels of silver, thousands and thousands of dollars. His mother, not knowing he took it, was cursing the person that took it. Cursed be on you. 
Cursed be on your cattle. Kind of like, you know, the way we feel about somebody when we're driving down the road and they cut us off. And you ever, you know, you ever imagine bad things to happen to those people? I have. Or a cop, you know, you ever had a cop stop you? And you're just like, oh, you know, and you wish bad things on them. And so she was pronouncing these curses, and, and especially in animistic religions in Africa, witch doctors that pronounce these curse, curses can have a, a, a sway, a, a, can really have a controlling effect on these people. So the son was hearing this, and he says, Mom, i got to confess. I took the money. Here's the money. He gave the money back to her. She says, Oh, blessed are you, my son. Thank you so much. You're giving this money back to me. I'm going to dedicate 200 shekels of this to the Lord. And it's just not any Lord. It's, it's the same Lord that Moses served and the same Lord that Abraham served. And so she's going to take 200 shekels of this and build a couple idols. And she's dedicating it to the Lord. Now, Mount Ephraim is, is, is just one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so it says that Micah, this lady's son, had a house of gods. And he also dedicated these gods to the Lord. Does this sound kind of confusing to you? Sure is to me. Well, why is he having idols? Why is he dedicating idols to God? So then this Levite comes traveling. He's uh, traveling around. And he comes, and this guy Micah says, you know what? It's better for me to have a Levite as my priest, because he had consecrated his sons to be his priests. Now, we're, we're talking about commandment after commandment after commandment here being broken. Moses gave the Ten Commandments. The land, commandments are expounded on in uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, repeated in Deuteronomy. And this guy uh, is, is talking about the Lord God, the uh, the word in our Bibles is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When they're all capitals, it means either Jehovah, Romanized pronunciation, or Yahweh, closer to Hebrew pronunciation. He's talking about the same God that Moses served and Abraham served. And so he knows it's... It, the more you read this chapter, the more you understand, he knows more about what God taught Moses than what we initially find out. Because he finds out that he sees a priest, and he says, hey, it's better for me to have a priest in my house of gods than my sons, because they're of the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi is the tribe from which we, God said only the priests are to come to work in the tabernacle. And so he wants this priest to come, because he's, he's showing that he knows a little bit more about the Mosaic law. And then he says, if you come, I'll provide you clothing, I'll provide you food, I'll provide you everything you need, just... Be my priest, will you do that? And the guy agrees. And the last, the, this guy is all mixed up. This guy Micah, his mom, they're worshiping false gods. They're dedicating uh, things that they have to, to the Lord. They're, they're, they have a, a dedicating false idols to God. It talks about different idols being made here, different objects of worship. And you would expect if somebody lives like that and knows anything about what Moses taught, you would expect them to expect problems for God to chastise them. But that's not what he says here. The very last verse here says, Judges 16, Judges 17, verse 13. It says, Then said Micah, I know now that the Lord will do me good, seeing that I have a Levite as my priest. So this guy is expecting God to bless him. Now, notice the confidence that Micah speaks with. He has false gods. He has a false house of gods. He's allowing his sons to be priests, which only Levites are supposed to be priests. A Levite comes in. Not all Levites are supposed to be priests. Only the, of one family, of Aaron's family, uh, we have all these laws being broken, all this idolatry coming through. And he says, now I know that God is going to bless me because now I have a Levite as my priest, expecting some type of favor for God because this Levite is helping him worship in his house of false gods. It's all confusing. And that's why I have the title, I know that God's going to bless me. What in the world is this guy thinking? 
But the more I look at this passage, and for a long time this passage was confusing to me, I find out that this really isn't that far from the religious atmosphere that we live in today. Because we have religions that have statues. Christian religions. And they bow to them. And they pray to them. In Russia, the big religion is Russian Orthodox. And Orthodox in English, we don't use the word a whole lot. and It doesn't have a big impact on us. In Russian, the word is Pravna Slavna. And Pravna Slavna means, uh, there are two very common Russian words that means correct glory or correct praise, correct worship. And so basically, when somebody hears that word in Russian, that's correct praise, correct worship. They think they have the correct way to worship God. And very common in Russian Orthodox Church, uh, they, they look down at Catholics. They split from Catholicism about a thousand years ago. They think Catholics are way back sudden because they have statues. But the Russian Orthodox Church doesn't have statues. They have pictures called icons. And they burn incense to them. And they pray to them. And they bow to them. And we have large Christian denominations that expect, fully confident, that God is going to bless them, but yet they get some of the simple commandments in the Bible mixed up. Now, how many commandments do we have in the Bible? Ten. Ten. Okay? You ever wonder why there's Ten Commandments? Why isn't there seven? That's the number commonly used in the Bible. Why isn't there 365? Why isn't there 17? I really don't know. I guess one reason God gave us Ten Commandments is because we have ten fingers. Right? Makes it easier to count. Don't have to take your shoes off. Now, God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's a great God, and he's a complicated God. And he gives us hints in Scripture when you study some of the doctrines of the Bible, what it's like, just some, gives us some small hint of what God is like. God is timeless. He's not tied to time. He sees a thousand years in the future as he sees a thousand years in the past, just like he sees today. He created time. He created us. He's not tied to any of that. And you begin to understand God a little bit, you understand He's a big, powerful, and to our finite minds, very difficult to comprehend. But when God communicates to us about salvation, God communicates very clearly. He doesn't want there to be any ambiguity. Ambiguity. Let's say that right. He doesn't want there to be any problems. He doesn't want there to be any miscommunication. He doesn't want us to have to have to be left in any darkness trying to figure out salvation whatsoever. And now the Ten Commandments aren't given to us for us to obey for salvation. The Ten Commandments are given to us to show us that we can't keep any of God's commandments. That we can't be perfect. That we need God to save us. So there's a lot of problems here in this chapter, but I just want to briefly look at just, just one the commandment, and it's the first commandment. Go back to uh, Exodus chapter 20. Um, it talk, that's where God first gives the Ten Commandments to Moses. And um, I got way too much material here and not enough time to give it, so we're going to have to fly, fly through this this morning. But Exodus chapter 20, if you want to turn there, um, they may put the words up on the screen. It, this is how the first commandment starts out. I, and, these words, uh, and God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord the, thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So when God gives the Ten Commandments, he says, he draws all attention to himself. He says, I'm the Lord thy God that brought thee out of Egypt. I'm the one that brought you out of the house of bondage. Have you ever wondered why God demands all praise and all honor? Have you ever thought that's a little, maybe arrogant of God to demand all praise and all honor and all glory and always be worshipped? I have. Okay? God is not offended by you asking difficult questions. It doesn't bother God. And I've asked that question, along with a lot of hard questions that maybe preachers are afraid to ask from a stage. I've asked those things. And what I've understood, and I don't understand it all, but God deserves all praise. He, he demands all praise because one thing, He's worthy. 
because he made everything. He's all powerful. He's all righteous. He's all holy. He's our redeemer. He told Israel, I brought you out of the house of bondage. I, I delivered you out of this problem. God is our redeemer. He's our savior. He, he's, he's the one that saves us. But more than that, if we do what God wants us to do, God is smarter than we are and he knows the future. And I could compare it to raising my kids. If I told my kids, hey, do what you want to do. The checkbook is yours. Here's my wallet. Okay? You guys make the rules. What would my, what would, what would my kids be like today? Well, they wouldn't go to school. They would eat candy all the time. Our finances would be a big mess. They would be a big mess. They would be spoiled. They would have all kinds of problems. But since we are the adults and we put the leadership and we lay down the rules, thankfully our kids are a lot better off than they would be as if we did otherwise. And when God demands all worship, all praise, all honor, he knows what's best for us down the road. If we put ourselves first and our desires first and what we want first, he knows that down the road that's going to hurt us. That's going to destroy us. It's going to be bad for us. So God, out of his mercy, demands to be put first in the throne of our lives. So there's a lot of reason for that. It says here, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That should be enough. End of the first commandment. I don't think we need anything else. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But the God... And his effort to be crystal clear the way he communicates goes on farther. He almost talks to us like we're kindergartners just to make sure we understand. Okay? He says, Thou shalt not make, an, uh, thou shalt ma not make you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the wonder under the earth. I read that a little bit wrong. Thou shalt shall not make into thee any graven image or any likeness. So, you know, the Orthodox think they're better than Catholics because they don't have image. But the Bible says no likeness of anything. You don't make an image, you don't make a likeness. If you look up in the sky, a star, clouds, planets, anything you see up there, a rock flying through the air, don't make an image of it, don't make a likeness of it. If you see it here on earth, a person, a dog, a tree, uh, you name it, if you can find anything on here, earth, don't make an image of it. Don't make a likeness of it. And if you see anything one in the water, get a scuba gear if you want to. If you can go down there and fight it, don't make an image of it and don't make a likeness of it. You see how clear God is here in the first commandment? Do you think it's difficult to understand this language? No, it's very simple. Why is it very simple? Because when God wants to communicate with us about our need for salvation and salvation itself God communicates with crystal clarity to his creation. It's that important to him. The first commandment goes on. It says, Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them. A lot of the Orthodox, they say, Oh, we're not worshiping these things. We're just using them as objects of worship. We pray to them. We kiss them. We bow down before them. But here it doesn't say don't worship them. It says don't bow yourself down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So God leaves all room for doubt, any questions about what he intends to talk about, completely open. I mean, this is very simple stuff. And God goes on to say he's a jealous God. Wives, listen, there's a good kind of jealousy and a bad kind of jealousy, right? Do you want your husbands to have a good kind of jealousy? In other words, if a man comes up and flirts with you, is it okay if your husband steps aside and says, hey, we can share? <laughs> the more the merrier. Is that the type of behavior you want your husband to have? No, you want your husband to have that good kind of jealousy. Wives, do you want your gut husband to pursue you now just as much as they pursued you when they were dating you? That's a good kind of jealousy, right? And that's the way God models for men to love their wives, and that's the way God pursues us. God loves us. 
He cares for us. And He does it so much. He came to this earth and was born in human flesh and died on the cross for your sins and my sins. God pursues us. He loves us. He goes after us. That's sometimes how come we have problems and difficulties in this life? Because sometimes we don't seek after God until the chips are down and things are difficult. And God in His mercy keeps pursuing and keeps seeking. We talk about how we need to abandon everything for God. God abandoned everything for us. So here in the first commandment, you can see how rich and how beautiful and how full it is that God in his mercy demands to be put first because he knows what's best for us. That we don't put anything, whether it's our possessions, whether it's something that we can find higher than him. You know what? You can make an idol with your mind. Somebody says, I don't believe God would ever send anybody to hell. Well, your God wouldn't send anybody to hell. Because your God doesn't exist. Because you've made this make-believe God up in your mind. And it's idolatry. The Bible says covetousness is idolatry. And Colossians, Paul says. So you can see here, when you look at Micah, and you look at how Micah was using all this idolatry to worship the Lord, you wonder, how did he get there? How in the world, then, I mean, it's not like you had 568 commandments to look at and try to, it's only 10 commandments, and it's the very first one. How could Micah have gotten so far away from the things of God? And the answer is, it says there, uh, that there was no king in Israel, and every man did that, did that which seemed right to him, or did that which was pleasing in his own eyes. That he would, Israel, after they were given the commandments to follow God, they looked at foreign cultures and they say, hey, that's a neat temple. I think I'll adopt that. Oh, I, I like those idols. Wow, that's neat. And look at that country. They're powerful. Those gods have blessed them. Maybe those gods will bless us. And so they look at other things and what seems pleasing in their sight, they adopt to themselves. We do the same thing today. They got in this big mess, if you study the context here, because generations abandoned, forsook the word of God and did that which seemed best to them. That's what atheism is. Atheism is abandoning, trying to get out from any accountability to God. They expect us to believe that in the beginning there was nothing and nothing happened to it and now we have everything. What's the only thing that can happen to nothing? Nothing. No dust, no vacuum, no anything. You can, you can look at this. We have a generation, you know, we look at how confused Micah is here. Folks, our generation is just as confused today. We have the same problem that Micah had that happening today. People are all confused how to serve God. All confused how to find salvation. You know, as clear as the Ten Commandments is, as clear as the First Commandment is, the, God, the, the plan of salvation is just as clear. When God... Yes, he's a complicated God, but when he communicates to us about how to find him, how to know him, he speaks to us as children. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. How can you get more simple than that? You trust in Jesus. You repent of your sins. You trust in Jesus. The only way to God is through Jesus. That's why Jesus Christ came down. I talk to people a lot on the street, and I say, you know, how do we get forgiveness of sins? How do we go to heaven? Oh, go to church, read the Bible, do what the Bible says, follow God. They'll, do, they'll say all these things, and they won't even mention the name Jesus. Colossians, or uh, Galatians chapter 3, last verse. For if we get saved by doing what's in the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If Christ is, if, if that's what we need to get saved, then why did Jesus come? There was no reason for his coming. Salvation is through Christ alone. And you know what? This not only, this thing about salvation through Christ alone, it not only is good for our families, it's not only good to have a good, healthy worldview of the world around us, it not only can help us through our difficulties here, but if you get on this train and follow it all the way down to the end of the tracks, we're going to find in Matthew chapter 7 where this leads to. Matthew chapter 7. I think it's verse 19.
verse, verse 21, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name have we not done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So according to Matthew chapter 7 here, there's going to be a lot of people in the judgment after death standing before God, just like Micah. Micah had all this confused religion and, and had everything mixed up. And he says, now that I have a Levite as my priest in my house of God's, I know God's going to bless me. See the confidence that Micah had at that time? There are going to be people at judgment standing before God. And they're sure they're going to heaven. I mean, they have been climbing that religious ladder all their life. One rung, they got baptized when they, were, when they were babies. Another rung, they attended church on Christmas and Easter. Another rung, they tried not to kill people and they tried not to have adultery on their spouse. Another rung, they tried to be good people and bring their children upright. Another rung, uh, they tried to give to charities and give money to church. And rung after rung after rung, climbing this ladder of religion to get to the very top at the end of it all and find out that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. That's heartbreaking. To me, as a minister of the gospel, trying to tell people what the gospel says about salvation, that is horrible. And God says, listen, there's going to be many, many in that day that are fully expecting that they're just like this with God. And God's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But we've done all this for you. We served you. We've done all these things. God says, I never knew you. Why? Because they took philosophies from their parents, philosophies from their church, philosophies from other people, philosophies from television, philosophies from internet, and never took the time to open the Word of God and see what the Bible says. Let's close this sermon here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. The book of Judges is the book that we've just been talking about, Judges chapter 17. Uh, the next book is uh, Ruth, and the next book after, it's a very short book. Next book after that is 1 Samuel. So, Israel got started out right with Moses. Moses brought them out of Egypt. God gave the Ten Commandments. God blessed them and used them. And then Judges is a time of just backsliding of Israel. Problem after problem. Probably one of the darkest days of Israel's history is the book of Judges. The next book, major book after that, is 1 Samuel. And 1 and 2 and Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, you got the golden years of Israel. Israel today looks back on those years, the King David, King Solomon, is the best years ever. So what took Israel from this deep, dark time of spiritual confusion to the time of the best years possible, and God blessing them better than they've ever had in their history. What was, what, what was that change agent that brought them from religious confusion to being used of God in a great way? Just a couple things here I'd like to use in conclusion. First of all, there was this guy named Samuel. Samuel was born, and his, his mother was barren, couldn't have any kids. She said, God, if you give me a kid, if you give me a son, I'll dedicate him to you. God gave Samuel, and when Samuel was weaned, she took him to the temple, and she says, he's going to be a servant for the temple. And so Samuel grew up as a servant in the temple. And it says that in uh, chapter 2, verse 18, and, man, and, and Samuel served the Lord, being a child, from his youngest years, Samuel served in the temple. So what happened for Israel to have such a change for the good? What turned them from this road of religious confusion and darkness and idolatry to a place of blessing and being used of God? And that's because one man decided to serve God. His mother put him there, and it was Samuel's desire to serve God. He wasn't the priest. He cared, washed the clothes for the priest. He moved things around for the priest. He did whatever the, they asked him to do. He was a servant in the temple. And if you want to serve God, if you want God to let, 
to use you to make a difference, you've got to be willing to serve no matter what. To serve completely. Abandon yourself to be used of God to serve. The next thing that happened is it says in the beginning of verse 3, and the, and, and the child Samuel ministered before the Lord. There he is. He's serving before the Lord. Bef, uh, unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of God and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And there was no open vision. The word of God was very rare. That's one of the reasons Israel got into the mess they did. The word of God was rare. They, they consulted what we would say today, media, internet, friends, parents, churches, all kinds of things, building a completely false view, making up their own religion, completely confident that God was going to bless them. That's a dangerous road to go down. The word of God was rare in those days. And back then, when the Bible was being written, back in the Old Testament, God would communicate with somebody through a vision. That person would see that vision. He would communicate it to Israel. And many times it would be written down, and that's the Bible that we have. And God didn't communicate to his people because they didn't care to open his word. And so when you look at the very end of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 19, it says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did not let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. You study the life of Samuel, he served God completely. His life was completely dedicated to do whatever the priest wanted him to do. And Samuel, from Dan to Beersheba, that's basically saying from the north to the south, you study his life, he taught God's word. And folks, that's what we're commanded to do. We're commanded to serve, to be servants, and we're commanded to give God's word to this lost generation. Out these doors, there's people that are confused. Out these doors, there's people that, that have, don't know their right hand from their left hand when it comes to what God wants, how to get saved. They're trusting in their church. They're trusting in their works. They're trusting in their religion. They're hoping in their atheism. Maybe it's not true. They're hoping in this and trusting in that. And they have no idea what the Bible teaches. And that is our responsibility. That we, the Bible is very clear. It's very concise to give the clarity, crystal clarity of the gospel. And it's not hard. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just as easy in Russian as it, as it, as it is in English. It's crystal clear, easy to understand whatever language you speak because God wants you with him the rest of his life. He wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to live in you and bless you and indwell in you. And it is our job to serve and it is our job to give the word of God with crystal clarity to bring some solution to this horrible religious confusion out there that ought not be. Because God did everything he can to make it as clear and easy as possible. Bruce. Thank you. Forgive me. I guess we can go back to the old KISS song, keep it simple, stupid, right? Sometimes simple is better, and simple is the gospel. And I love making this statement. When somebody says, it's all confusing, you have to just say, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Not what man's opinion is or philosophies would be. What does the Bible say? And if we make our decisions based on that simple statement, we understand salvation, we understand God, because we understand the word. And that is an eye-opener and a thought provoker to think in the third world, in the world around us, can we impact them? And I think we can. And how do we do it? One missionary, one message, one invitation, one life at a time. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the instruction of how easy we can mess up our church, our lives, our ministry, or even our calling because of the confusion 
because we try to do so much and we try to add a little bit of everything so we lose the purity of what you want for us in the message, in the church, and even in our own lives. So Lord, I pray you'll give us that clarity, that understanding that is very simple to understand the word. We don't want to make the word rare. We want to make it alive and fruitful in every area of our life and in our church, in our mission. We don't want to dilute it. We want to make it powerful and strong. So give to us that desire. Thank you for Keith and sharing his message and his heart for his people that you've called him to. I pray that you'll give him the strength to do that, give him the clarity to do that, and Lord, give him the resources in order to accomplish his goal. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor Al.